Very sure. Good. I'm Brian Johns with Virginia Organizing, and uh, we're here tonight to talk about who pays and who benefits in the Virginia State budget. And this is a presentation, and I, I want to start off by saying a couple things. One is that I'll be talking a lot at the beginning, and I just want to preface that I'm not usually comfortable with, uh, you know, one person standing up and kind of, you know, spouting a lot. So I, but this is a presentation, so that's where mainly that will come in. And there is a piece where I'm going to ask for some volunteers, but I just want to let folks know. I'll be talking a lot, and then we'll open it up, hopefully, to some good discussion and conversation about next steps. Uh, three other things I was thinking about on the way up here is that I say this at every presentation of these that we do. One is that um, we believe firmly that everybody can pick up on this, these things. I think that a lot of times uh, issues like tax and budget, I know, you know, 10 years ago when we started working on this, my eyes would glaze over, right, and, and, and not really think much about tax and budget or what was going on and how it affected me. Um, and and I, we figured out that, that everybody has the ability to understand these. There are some basic concepts, and this, I think, goes along with any issue we work on. Uh, but really, you know, I tell people all the time, I, I grew up 20 minutes from the capital of south of Richmond in the Petersburg area. I had studied government in college and learned more in the first two hours at the General Assembly uh, than I did in all those years of education, right? And, and that's just to say that this is stuff that we can get our heads around, and certainly our, the goal of this presentation is to make this information accessible. I'll also get this out to everybody if we get an email or however you want to communicate with me or Margaret or the, the conveners <laughs> of the Occupy movement here. I can get this to folks, so don't feel like you have to furiously be scribbling if you don't want to tonight. Certainly, if that's how you learn, that's how I learn. Uh, feel free to, but don't feel like you have to. Uh, the other is that the third thing is that we are going to focus tonight mainly on, in general, the, the concepts around the need to improve our, our tax structure in the state of Virginia in order to make it work better for working folks. Uh, we believe three things about the tax structure, and this goes back to 2002, 2003 when we started working on budget issues. One is it's out of date. Our tax structure currently is, is completely out of date and doesn't, it hasn't caught up or kept up with, uh, with how things have gone in the last... 80, 90 years. It was set up in the 1920s as a progressive taxation system uh, that put more impetus on folks who were able to pay. They paid a higher percent. Um, the tax brackets haven't changed since then, so that now that's regressive, and we'll talk about progressive and regressive a little bit, um, but we think it's out of date. The second thing is we think it's inadequate. We don't think our current tax and budget structure in the state raises enough money for the services we need, right? Whether it's living wage jobs or health care or you know, looking around in 2002, it's still the case today, we're at or near the bottom in a lot of major indicators, right, whether it's Medicaid, Medicare payments, our system doesn't cover as much as it does if you're born in other states, right? Um, and that's across the board on a lot of different issues. So uh, we believe that the system is out of date, the tax system, we believe it's inadequate, and we also believe it's unfair. That's the third point, is that it asks people who are already in the low income brackets or who are already working or underemployed or unemployed to pay more as a share of their income than it does for folks at the top. Um, and we'll get into that in a second too. I just wanted to go over kind of real briefly what's happened since we started this campaign. In 2002, 2003, we were working with a lot of groups like the AFL-CIO, um, like Education Association, uh, the Interfaith Center. Uh, lots of groups came together, lots of churches, uh, synagogues, social service providers, and really started to look at back at that time even then, we were feeling like we weren't having all of the needs that we met, that we needed to have met, met in the state of Virginia, that the tax structure wasn't cutting it. Um, and so folks came together, started talking about, and we developed the very root of this, this pr presentation around that time. Uh, and in 2003, we ended up saying, let's just spend the year educating folks. So it's kind of a similar thing, right? You, you'll see elections, and you'll see all the, the um, rhetoric that's thrown out there around who's pro-business or who's anti-business and what that means. And then you hardly hear anything about what happens right when they're up in Richmond. Um, we were hardly hearing every, anything about what they were actually voting on in terms of taxes, in terms of job creation, and things like that. So we wanted to create a presentation to help do that. We did this to over 200 presentations to civic groups, you name it, all across the state in 2003. And leading up into 2004 and 2005, we wanted to make sure that people had a good education base because we knew that would be a huge year in the General Assembly. At that time, in 2004, uh, governor was Mark Warner, so he was a Democratic governor. The Senate and the House were controlled by Republicans, um, so it was, it was split in nature. Uh, but everybody felt that there needed to be something done about the tax structure, even back at that point. And it's hard to 
imagine now in some ways, since the economy has tanked so much in the last couple years, but even back in 04 and 05, there were some major issues with the Virginia tax structure. And so uh, that year we got a bill introduced by Senator Louise Lucas, who's a woman in, in Tidewater. There were also tons of other bills. Uh, they debated it a lot in the General Assembly. As you all probably know, General Assembly is either 45 or 60 days, and our budget's done on a biennium, so it's done for two years. So they were doing the, the 05, 06 budget, I guess, at that point. Um, and for the first time in the history of the Virginia legislature, they didn't come out with a budget. Uh, in, the, in the first time of one of the longest standing uh, democratically elected legislatures in the world. Um, and they couldn't come to terms with it. So the governor brought everybody back. And what they ended up doing in 2004 was hammering out an agreement that actually tinkered with the tax structure and raised a little bit of revenue. They did some things around uh, cigarette taxes they increased. They increased some sales taxes. Uh, and again, we'll get into some more of this in terms of what, what's a sales tax and what's, what's a, an income tax and things like that. But they made some small increases. They, they put some new money into education and to some other things. They didn't touch transportation. They didn't touch a lot of other things. But it did raise a little bit of revenue without just completely cutting. Um, and now it's an 04 and 05. Unfortunately, you know, after that happened, one thing that happened was a lot of moderate Republicans and uh, mainly moderate Republicans in different parts of the state got taken out by, by further right-wing opponents uh, who said, we don't like that you guys did a deal on the budget um, that raised taxes in any way. So that happened. And then the other thing was everybody said, well, we took care of it in 04 and 05. So that basically through from 05 to like 09, nobody was really talking much about tax and budget issues in the state, except to be talking about uh, once the economic downturn started, we've been talking about cuts ever since, and that's it. You know, no one's really talking about raising revenue in the state legislature right now. So that brings us up to where we are tonight, and, that, and that's what I'll do. You'll notice the date on this is January 3rd, 2011. For the most part, it's all updated. Uh, there wasn't any major changes last year because we are in between budget cycles. This year will be the session that they'll be debating the next two-year budget. So all this information, even though it's from... January of this past year uh, is still it's as up to date as, as we can get it. So that, that's the, the preview. And we'll start tonight with talking about where money comes from. And am I in people's way? I'm trying to figure out where to stand so you can see. I want to make sure you can. Um, can folks read? Uh, I'll read the little bits. But talking first about where money comes in the state budget. There are two pots in the Virginia state budget. One is the general fund and one's a non-general fund. The general fund is what we'll talk about tonight. They're both about 50% of the budget in total. The non-general fund is pretty much stuff that you can't touch. It's all already allocated. It's either money coming in from the federal government. It either is directly allocated for transportation or education. It's different things that our legislature doesn't have much ability at all to mess with, the non-general fund. What we have the ability to change and to, to work on is the general fund. So this is all, and a lot of this information uh, is based on either state, straight from the state to so the Virginia Department of Planning and Budget, and I've got, there's a resource page at the end if folks are interested. But for the, the last numbers we've got for fiscal year 2010-2011 budget, this is where money came into the state. 66% of it from individual income tax. Um, and most folks are familiar with income tax, I assume. It's based on how much you, you make and that's how much you end up paying. 20% of it comes in with sales and use taxes, uh, and that includes things like food taxes, that includes things like, you know, um, certain industries or certain services you go to use, uh, then you pay a tax on different services. It's amazing how political a document the budget is, right? That's another thing we talk a lot about is that a budget's a really political document. You'll go in and you can look at what services have taxes on them, and you can kind of pick out who's got the most powerful lobbyists, right? Because in Virginia, uh, certain services don't have taxes. At, at one point, uh, lawyer services and accountant services, there are some big major things that in other states have tax on those services that didn't in Virginia because they had a powerful lobby. So that's just to point out that a lot of this, none of this is by accident, right? This is decisions that have been made by our, our lawmakers. Corporate income tax is 5% for this most recent fiscal year. Um, it, in the past, it's been much higher. For a long time, it hovered around 13 14%. But they've been chipping away at it. And something we'll talk about, I think that it's a, one way we've worked with a lot of Occupy movements around the state recently, which I'll talk about at the end, has been to look at corporate income tax because there's a, a bill introduced every single year to completely wipe out corporate income tax in the state of Virginia so the corporations aren't paying any taxes. Right now it's 
is by law. Uh, I'll, I'll mention this again later. Wells Fargo, for example, paid 0.7% in state corporate income tax last year because of a number of loopholes. So, you know, companies are supposed to be paying 5%. It ends up being about 5% of what the state pulls in right now. But it also is something that, especially looking at what reality is going to look like in January, you know, there's, there's a good chance that, that bill will go through again. And usually that, the bill that kills corporate income tax dies in the Senate every year. You know, who knows how that looks this year. So we'll be pushing on that on the Senate level. The last bit is kind of a miscellaneous other taxes and revenues, and that includes public utilities taxes, insurance premium taxes. That's a, a small, a small chunk up there, 9%. We're good to move on? Excuse me, did you just say Wells Fargo paid 0.07% tax? 0.7. Oh, 0.7. Okay. Right. If I were to Wells Fargo, I'm going to bring this up. There you go. <clears throat> so that's where money comes in. This is the spending side. So this is where money goes out of the state budget. So I'll read again because I know some of this is small. The largest chunk, though, is education. It's 42%. Uh, it looks like that right now the projection is that they're, they're trying to get that down towards 39% for the coming biennium. And this was up around 46 47% of what we were spending was going to education even just a couple years ago. So this is just, education is still the largest chunk, but it's been shrinking. The second largest is health and human resources. Um, that's where, you know, right now the, the state government is in a discussion about how they're gonna implement health reform. Um, and one of the things that they have the option to do is create an exchange so it actually help bring down some of the money the state would have to pay out of that. Uh, in, in that process all along, Anthem and other insurance companies have been right there really pushing to, to keep the state out of regulating them. Um, so that's just an aside, but it ties to some of the other work we're doing too. But health and human resources, 27% of the money that goes out. 14% is general government. So this is like the governor's administration, finance, executive offices, and central appropriations. Um, that, that, that's a pretty broad category, and I can get, if people want specifics for what that is, I can specifics, but that's some cabinet level positions come out of this general government budget, some have their own budget line. So it's all, again, it's um, just structured, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense <coughs> all the time. But 14% is general government, 11% is public safety, and 6% is other. <coughs> and the little bits under that are commerce, uh, the Department of Commerce, Department of Transportation, uh, and, and also just transportation funding in general, it comes out of that 6%. General Assembly, their own costs, um, courts, uh, technology, and natural resources all come out, out of that 6%. So this is where the money goes out of the state budget. So VDOT comes out of that other piece of the, of the pie rather than general government. Exactly. Yeah, and I don't know exactly why they put that piece there. It's just separated out as its own. Um, any other questions? Yeah. I don't have it here tonight, but I could get it to folks. That's a good question. Yeah. Oh, I assume law enforcement comes out of public safety. <coughs> yes. 11%. Is, is there anything else? Fire. Uh, fire. 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 <coughs> right. That would be, you know, state police and, you know, a lot of our uh, sheriffs and, and local police, a lot of that comes out of public safety money uh, on this side. That's what public safety is. It's mainly the law enforcement side. Um, you know, and, and it's interesting, right? I mean, I think that, and we can talk a little bit about this later. You know, every year, the way the budget process happens is that about now, the, um, there are committees, the appropriations committees in both sides of the House, are put together their general thoughts on what the budget will be for the next two years. They get it out to all the agencies. You know, you've got to start looking at either you're going to stay same, we're going to have a surplus, or you're going to have cuts. The most recent thing we've heard is that all the agencies are being asked for 2, 4, and 8% cuts. Um, to, to be planning for on the next year. Um, the other thing, though, is that every January, usually it's in the middle of a snowstorm or terrible weather, but they have these public budget hearings, right? And I think folks have probably been to those. There was one here right over on campus not long ago, two maybe ago. two years ago. And that, you know, that brings another point that I think that we found in doing these presentations. Those hearings are a real interesting exercise, one in patience, because they can last for hours. 
But really, it's, it's where the Senate and the House Appropriations Committees come, and basically here, in different parts of the state, people talking about why they can't have their programs cut. And so we came into the one in Blackford two years ago, and there were probably, it felt like there were probably 30 sheriff's officials, sheriff's officers, um, or local police. Uh, you know, you know you're know, you starting to feel budget cuts when you've got folks coming in that aren't always traditional allies. And that was one of the things that hit us. It's like, wow, you know, this is hitting everybody, not just folks that we usually work with necessarily, but also across the board. And we've got, in Washington County, we had to cut uh, a huge number of police officers over the last year. And I'll, I'll talk about Washington County a little bit because that's where I live. We also had 42 teaching positions cut in, the, in Washington County this past year um, as a result of budget cuts. So this is where, you know, <clears throat> this is where the money goes out, but even then, you know, a lot of times that, that buck stops on the local level. That's a great point. I don't have anything right now, but it'd be really easy because we update this every year. And so even since 02, we could do it. But I know some of this information we get too from the Commonwealth Institute, which is another group in the state of Virginia that does a lot of fiscal analysis. And they've got reports on the budget every single year too. But I'll check on that. That's a really good question. Um, it'd be useful to compare. And I'm going to write notes um, as we go too, because this is always a work in progress. Great. Any other questions on where money goes? What about yeah. prison expenses? Where does that come out? Of? That would be out of public safety, too. Public That's a good question. Yeah, so the public safety. And, and as you, many of you all know, right, for a while, um, prison construction was one of our, our Southwest Virginia economic development engines, right? As it seemed like Governors Allen and Gilmore, I believe, in particular, um, were big on that. But yeah, all that budget's in the public safety piece. So that's a great point, That's as well as the Exactly. It's not just that the pie is shrinking, it's also that right. the, the um, decision has been made to cut education back. Yeah, transportation was a big part of it. I mentioned in 2004, 2005, they didn't reach any agreement on transportation. Okay. And they've been grappling with that for years. Not as much in our part of the state as in, you know, you always hear in, in Tidewater and Northern Virginia, they're always talking about the roads being way overcrowded. Um, and, and, uh, but still, transportation took some of that. Um, health and human resources, I think, took some of that. But yeah, it was different pieces of it. Good to move to the next slide here. This just shows uh, in the last few years, Daniel mentioned austerity on the state level and what we see. Um, since the economic downturn started in 2008, um, this, is, this is what we've had to deal with in the last several years. We haven't had uh, any sort of energy or momentum in the General Assembly, there's always a couple of bills that try to get at it, but we really haven't had anybody that said, let's raise taxes or let's figure out ways to raise revenue. It's really been, what can we cut? Um, and this, so this just gives you a sense of, of what's been cut each year uh, in billions uh, over the last several years and what's projected in 2012. Um, and this is based, again, they passed in, in 2010, they passed the 11 and 12 budget, so this year we'll be going so it's a huge amount of money, right? This is not, this is significant cuts every single year. So every year that money that's coming in um, and goes out, both those pies are getting smaller. And that's what we talked about when we were saying it's inadequate. And of course on the bottom it's talking about because of the failing economy, Governors Kane and McDonald, the General Assembly have been forced to cut over 15 billion from the state's general fund. The other thing that's interesting to me in looking at this is um, we don't ever hear Governor McDonald necessarily talking about, uh, I mean, he talks about how many great cuts he's made to, to balance the budget, but and folks, you know, his line recently has been we've got a surplus, right? Have folks heard that? It seems like the last three years the governor's talked about we've got a surplus in the state of Virginia. Uh, and, and we think that that is not entirely honest uh, discussion of what's happening with our budget, to put it nicely. To, the, to me, uh, the example I get all the time is it's like saying, you know, look, I found $10. I've got a $10 surplus right now, even though I haven't paid my mortgage bill yet. 
Um, but I've got a $10 surplus right now because I found it. And they've done a lot of things which you all know about, I'm sure, you know, whether it's deferring retirement service payments or whether it's making, you know, uh, all these cuts. Uh, but, they, you know, we feel like that surplus is tricky. What's projected for this year alone is $800 million in shortfalls. Um, and it will be real interesting. The governor puts forward his budget in December every year. It will be interesting to hear how that is, is talked about. Uh, because it's pretty undeniable right now that there is absolutely no surplus. Um, so that's just as an aside. How did the General Assembly close its budget shortfall? Is there a question? Yeah. What happened to the about $800 million that it was a surplus like in June? Right. No, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know where that's going. But we coming. do have a shortfall. We do have a shortfall now, and that's why they're asking the agencies for up to 8% cuts and to get ready. Um, yeah, I was talking to a guy from DEQ the other day in Abingdon who they're, talk, they're looking at possibly using half, losing half the DEQ workforce in the Department of Environmental Quality in the Abingdon office, which covers, you know, the rest of the west of the state uh, in the next three years because of cuts. And this is right after, the, you know, we've been getting this general line all along, oh, there's surpluses, and, and it certainly hasn't been like go out there and spend. There's still been hiring freezes, but... Um, but yeah, the economy hasn't bounced back, so tax revenue projections have not met what they thought they were. And that's where some of that shortfall is coming. So this is how the General Assembly closed its budget shortfall in 2010 alone. 75% um, in cuts to programs, 10% uh, in deferring pension contributions, so that's the BRS, the Virginia Retirement System. 11% in Recovery Act funds, that's stimulus money from the federal government, and that is gone. Now, that's the other thing that's going to uh, play in this year as the General Assembly goes back. That 11% of our filling that hole is, is disappearing. And then the rest is new revenue. And mainly, you know, you hear this kind of, it's all, you know, they're wordsmithing, right? But um, a lot of folks uh, have taken these no tax increase pledges, but they'll do fee increases. So, like, you might notice that when you go to a state park, it's twice as much as it used to cost or things like that. They did a lot of small fee increases to generate some new revenue in that 4%. Would that include student tuition? Yeah, yeah, exactly, things like that. Where they can call, yeah, they don't have to call it a tax increase, but they can, it's a fee increase. What does the burning pension, the, the, the pension contribution mean exactly? Has anybody else seen this? Sometimes I'll get in a room and somebody said, knows a lot more about it than I do. It's really just saying that we're not going to pay, you know, every year um, uh, the Virginia is supposed to pay out to state employees the retirement system. Uh, and, and what they'll say is that we're not going to pay that this year. We'll hold off and pay that next year. Um, so it's like not, it's not a race in the bill, right? Or, it's not that they're not paying the people. It's they're not putting the money into the big pot. They're not escrowing right. the money. Right, right, exactly. They're not letting it accumulate. Private companies do the same thing. Right. The, the General Assembly raised about $270 million in new revenue through these fee increases, but cut over $4.5 billion from the budget in education, health and human sources, services, and other programs. Any other questions? You said that when the 11% yeah. of the Recovery Act funds disappeared, where did it go? It was, it was out of the stimulus bill. So the, whenever they passed that, it was, that was all to be spent by this year. Um, they, they, you know, all the weatherization money that's been coming in, for example, and different programs that the stimulus bill was funding, that money dries up this year. Right. Yeah, that was all kind of like grants almost. Or so that's part of the shortfall, right? Right, exactly. That'll be part of the shortfall. Yeah, that $800 million. Exactly. And, you know, it's interesting. It's not like, um, I don't know, I, I, won't, I won't do many asides, but it's not like we heard the General Assembly folks talking about, oh, it's so great that we're able to rely on 11% of the budget hole this year from the stimulus funds, right? It's kind of like they're most of the folks are talking on one side about how terrible the stimulus deal was, and then this year we're going to be asking a lot of our agencies to make cuts and not acknowledging that there was some, some 
positive uh, coming out of that. So the next thing is, is who's hurt by deep budget cuts? And in our opinion, it's everybody, right? This is just some of the major um, ways that you'll see in here and here and the upcoming session talks about where we'll have cuts. Um, you know, everybody can kind of guess where these are. And a lot of these that we see on the local level, right? The, the, um, you have folks, whether it's your K through 12, but, you know, in Blacksburg, right? Public colleges and universities, right? Down here, you guys get budgets every year and are asked to deal with whatever um, shortfalls that the state hands down, whether it's raising tuition or however, you, but you've got to figure out the cover. Libraries, like we're standing in, um, mental health treatment centers, uh, conservation and recreation, Medicaid, at risk youth, youth and families, public safety. These are all things that, that are going to get hurt by budget cuts and have been in that 15 billion you guys saw a couple of slides ago. Any other questions? Aren't you scratching your hands? No. I'm <laughs> <laughs> saw your arm go. Oh. Great. So let me see. This is just an example of last year. Uh, and again, this will, for the most part, the budget bills adopted accepted pretty much all of this from the governor's proposal. But December 17th of 2010, <coughs> right around the middle of December again this year, the governor proposes his budget. And, and that's why this year, it'll be really interesting because pretty much up until now, the governor's also been working off of Governor Kane's budgets. And so that's the starting point. And so this is this governor's one chance this session, and that's why it's even all the more important, it'll be interesting to see, you know, to really make his priorities known. Um, and that's what the governors do when they release their budgets. That's what happened. This was from last year. Again, it's just to give you an example of some of the things they did. They wanted to add $50 million to help college more, make college more accessible, add $54 million for economic development, create $4 billion transportation package. That, the transportation did not happen. Um, <clears throat> maybe small bits of it did. But the rest of it, you know, and, and unfortunately, I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling, but some of this is small, small bits of money when you're talking about the large here, he, state employees would have to pay their own 5% contribution to BRS, partially offset by a 3% salary increase for those employees, um, and then cut all state funding to public television and radio. And so some of these things didn't totally get implemented last year, but we can bet they'll be coming back again this year. Let's see. All right. We're gonna, now it's when I need some volunteers. May I get a couple of volunteers? I need seven of you. Anybody feel like stretching? <laughs> Great. All right. Cover this up for a second. This is possible. <laughs> All right. Seven volunteers. And this works to varying degrees of success, but I think the point will come across here. So if folks can't see, get to a point, and let's, let's move this a little bit here. And what we is ask you guys to line up shoulder to shoulder these chairs at the end of the here. So facing that wall, shoulder to shoulder. Come. Yes, there we go. Perfect. And if you can't see what I'm putting, what I'm putting on the floor, what we're doing is making a human bar graph. So I'm putting down percentages on the floor. One, two, three. I never measure out ahead of time, and it starts to look funny. Like so, um, whoops. I'm, I'm waiting to find one of these that's colored on. I have a two and a four year old that like to help me prepare for meetings uh. on the weekend, especially. And so, you might get one of these that has some pictures on it. So, all right, so here we go. This is going to go up to 10. So this axis is 1 through 10%. What we're going to do now is it, um, divide these folks up. When we're talking about budget numbers a lot, the way the, the state of Virginia uh, thinks about and talks about these things, they, they divide things into quintiles, right? So a fifth, 20%. And what we're going to do is divide you all into five. We'll start down here as the bottom, the bottom and this is the top. We've got seven. I know that. I didn't make a mistake. Um, sometimes people are like, well, you got seven up there. Um, so 
This will be quintiles, and this is as if every family in the state of Virginia was lined up shoulder to shoulder. And so we're going to go by which fifth. And what we're going to talk about, initially we're going to see how much that quintile makes as a family <coughs> average income per year. So we're going to start here at the bottom. Remind me your name? Doug. Doug. You will be the bottom 20%. Do you all have any wild guesses to the average family income in the bottom 20%? tax 
paid an average left over. So again, right, like Daniel said, this is folks making from 19000 to 36000 a year. The average tax they pay is $2,200 a year, and the average year left over to spend after that is paid is $24,500. The next third, the middle 20%, is also 8.4%. What that means for these folks is an average tax paid of $38, almost $3,900, and an average left over of $42,000. The next one is for the fourth 20% now, it, they pay in state and local taxes 7.9%. <coughs> so it's clustered, but it's still pointing this way, right? It's coming down as you get up in, in income. The average tax paid for these folks is $6,100 roughly, and the average left over is $71,000 after paying state and local taxes. Now the next 15% is a percent lower. They pay an average of 6.9% and local and state taxes. <laughs> and what this means for that next 15% is that they average, they pay $9,500, but they have left over $128,943. Okay. I'll take it, yeah. And then the last two, uh, the next 5%, the top 5% pays 6.6% in state and local taxes. So that's an average tax bill of almost $20,000 a year, but left over with close to $281,000 a year. And then the top 1% pay an average of 5.2% of their income in state and local taxes. 5.2? 5.2%. And so that means that they pay an average of $81,000 a year in taxes, but they, on average, have left over in this group almost a million and a half dollars after they pay state and local I just got the new Bentley one. <laughs> <laughs> right, you work, yeah, exactly. You just got well, that's your, your insurance payment on it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so what do folks think about this? How does this strike people? It's backwards. It's regressive, it's regressive right. That's the definition of regressive. Right. And in 1927, when the Virginia income tax was created, 1927, it was meant to be progressive. Like, they set it up. By those dollars, I think the upper limit was $17,000 a year. But it was graded, and it was based on how much you made as to how much you paid. The key is, except for minor tinkering, we haven't changed those brackets since 1927. So right now in the state, we effectively have a flat tax in some ways because we've got everybody over $17,000 is in the same bracket. And what that has meant is that in terms of actual numbers, this line is a regressive line, right? So that's what we mean when we're talking about the system's not only not raising enough money, but it's doing it in an unfair way. <laughs> Folks have any other thoughts or reactions? Or Did you say everyone over how much is yeah. essentially in a flat tax? 17,000. Um, so right, right. Are you going to take off that? Uh, yeah, I'll take this off in a second. You guys can sit down. Let's have a hand for the uh, volunteers. This is the one. This was my two-year-old's work uh, this afternoon. So. Um, so this is exactly what we were just talking about. Can folks see that all right? Um, middle and low-income Virginia families have a higher tax responsibility than wealthy families. And that's exactly what we just saw on this, this chart. 8.8 to 5.2. Clearer now. <laughs> Daniel makes everything clear. Yeah. So this is exactly what we talked about in the second, um, or the second after that, in terms of what's left over. And I picked this up because I knew there was. We had some stat in here about this. Is that um, this is the difference of what people pay in taxes and what they have left over to live on? Please note that the bars for the top two income groups go off the page. 
the bar for the top 5% would go on to the middle of the next page, and the bar for the top one would go on for another eight pages. <coughs> next eight pages. So the blue Whoa. is dollars, the dollar amount that the, each percent, each quintile pays in taxes, and the gold is the actual amount that they may have left over the month. Exactly. <laughs> On average. Exactly. So. But it's worrisome that because they have to pay taxes on food and other things. Right, we included state and local taxes, exactly, but they're very variable, yeah, so this looks different, you know, based on... I thought this was just income. No, no, this is, this is state and local, this includes sales and income. But not federal taxes. Right, not federal. Yeah, what's the state income, uh, rate, uh, sales tax? State sales tax? Was it 4.5% or was it 5? Is it 5 now? I believe it's 5. If I think that's it. Yeah. So this is kind of the, the last point of what we feel around needs to be done. Virginia's already made large cuts in our budget in response to the economic crash. On the other hand, we've raised very little new revenue to help close the budget shortfall. It's what we're all talking about, right? It's why people are in the streets, because people who are most directly hit and when we need the most help is when we're seeing these agencies that are having less and less uh, ability to cover our needs. Um, Virginia's wealthiest citizens also have a lower tax responsibility than those in the middle and working class. I think that um, mo this is relatively similar to most states at this point, although uh, a lot of states have a lot closer to a, a even line. Uh, only a couple have progressive tax structures. Um, but we've got, what'd you say? Which are those? I know Vermont does, uh, New Hampshire I think also has a progressive tax. There's just a couple. So what we've been talking about uh, is that the Virginia General Assembly, and this scratch out that should change at the 2012, should make reasonable tax increases instead of further cutting an already damaged budget, budget. And for fairness sake, we should raise taxes on the Virginians most able to pay with the least current tax responsibility. Those who have, like we said, that average one and a half million dollars left over. Do you have stats on how, what we tax people compares to what other states tax their I do have that. We don't have it in this, but I can send that out if that's useful to folks. So what you can do, and this is just kind of a jumping off point for the rest of the conversation, right? We've done a couple of things in response to this. Uh, one is that we're asking everybody to contact their senator and delegate and tell them how you think that this, should be problem, this problem should be solved. You'd be shocked, maybe you wouldn't, when you go up to, to Richmond or when you meet these folks on the local level, how many will say, I haven't had one person in my district say they want a tax increase. Um, and, or I haven't had one person say they want this. And they'll say, well, what about people asking for you to you know, not cut their teachers? You know, they don't count that in the equation. But uh, there's a really ideological stance. And we're asking people to contact folks, especially, I would say, you know, you've got a good opportunity with a new delegate uh, who may not know. I mean, good opportunity, I don't know, but it's a chance to at least go in and talk to this new delegate about what happened, so that you can say from day one, we were telling you we needed new revenue, right? And same with, you know, going and talk to Senator Edwards about, about what he's done over the last several years. Um, we're asking folks to write a letter to the editor. This is another thing where, you know, as you all know, we try to crank out tons of letters to the editor. We feel like it's a really good harbinger of, of uh, public opinion. It also can push the discussion when it's done well with other organizing. So, you know, letters to the editor, we've got a bunch recently uh, in Washington County from, from school board members and teachers. We had two school board members who came to us because we were doing this workshop and said, look, we're facing another big shortfall this year. Another one, after we just cut 42 positions. Um, they just cut, you know, the schools, and this is, you know, we're in good shape compared to a lot of counties in Washington County, but we just cut music and art down to every other week in all the elementary schools, right? And so it's like, we're, we're, we're still seeing worse. They're being asked to cut more. Um, but you, you said you cut 42 positions? Yeah. How many teaching positions are there in Washington County? Uh, that's a good question. I don't have it right off the top of my head. But 
Do you know it as a percentage of the? No, I don't know. Okay. No, I should know that. But yeah, it, it was a lot. <laughs> it was a substantial chunk. Mm -hmm. We've got you know four. But it's high forty-two schools, lost jobs. Small. Exactly. So, yeah. And in talk to friends to and other organizations about, about fair tax reform as a budget solution in the state. Um, this is other information. I can get this to folks. Um, these are resources, just so you know we've got them, uh, where we got information from in this. And this is some definitions and descriptions here. The last thing that we've been doing that I wanted to just throw out there as a possibility as well, the other thing, can I just cut this off? Can you go ahead and push the button? Um, the other thing we've been talking about recently, and I didn't, <clears throat> we don't have it in PowerPoint form yet, and you can't really see it very well on this copy. I've got a couple of other copies. But the, the other thing we've been talking about over the last couple of years is really the need to paint the picture for folks that there are actors we feel like who aren't paying their fair share out there. And they're both wealthiest and most able to pay individuals, but also corporations. And like I mentioned earlier, for example, Wells Fargo, uh, paid 0.7% in corporate income tax in the state last year. Um, and and the, it's supposed to be five, that's through, and I don't understand all of the, how the corporate tax holds work, but every year there's a, a fight to do away completely with the corporate income tax. Um, we're saying it should go the other way, if anything. Uh, and so one thing we've been doing, and this is just another thing, food for thought, and then, for thought, and then I'd open it up to discussion um, for whatever you guys want to do, um, but that we've put together a packet that's uh, about, it's all about divesting from Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, the big banks, and trying to get folks to move their money into smaller banks. Um, the last I saw last week, well, I don't want to, I don't want to misquote the number, but hundreds of thousands of folks have already done this across the country. We're working with a lot of groups to do it. And it is a way not only to, to get at some of the folks who have funded predatory lending and some of these other things that we've seen that have hurting people, but it also, creates the, the atmosphere also to push our legislators to say, look, people aren't happy with these folks getting away with not paying. So one thing we've done is rallies uh, and divestment actions in front of big banks, and we put together an easy packet. So if you guys are interested, I can send this on too. But it just it gives you information on um, why we want to do this. Here's how it works. Um, we have uh, some information on the three CEOs of the three largest banks uh, and some demands that we're asking, that they pay their fair share uh, that they stabilize the housing market and revitalize the economy, that they invest in American jobs and indiscriminatory and predatory lending. And then this just goes on, and, and we've just put it together so that people can do it if they want or take what they want from it. Um, but it also has a list of what you do if you're actually considering moving your funds um, or anything like that. So it's pretty much a ready-made ability to do something like this. But I would end right here, the, the presentation I've got here, and, and I'll open it up to questions or, or a conversation I really think it is something where this has made a lot of sense in different parts of the state to, to connect. Uh, I said at the beginning, Virginia Organizing, when we started working on this, it was because, much like the Occupy movement, we were having folks especially directly affected saying, look, we're getting hammered every single year. We've got to change the discussion so that it's not just cuts, but that we're talking about actually putting money into infrastructure and the services that we need. So I talked a lot. I apologize for that. But I thank you all for your attention, and I'd love to, to open it up.